Hi, everyone. Welcome to The Week Ahead. I'm Tony Nash. Today, we're joined by Joseph Wong, Adam Tumerkin, and Tracy, Tracy Shukart. Guys, I'm always flattered when guests of your caliber will come on the show. I'm so grateful that you uh, that you could be here today. Um, we're covering a few key themes. First is, uh, Joseph is going to talk us through a, a dovish Fed, or as I put, a dovish-ish Fed. That'll be a very interesting discussion. Adam's going to talk us through um, China's uh, overproduction. Will China drown the world in exports? And we'll talk through some JPY and, and affordability things as well. Uh, and then Tracy's going to talk us through energy markets and how hedge funds are rotating from energy stocks into oil. Uh, and we're looking at a few other things there as well. So guys, thank you always. Thank you for, uh, you've all been here before. And I'm so grateful, as I said, that, that people of your level of intelligence and experience and capability come on. Hi, everyone. We've introduced new subscription tiers for CI Markets. More data, more insights, and more options. CI Markets uses the power of AI to help you make better trading and investment decisions. It's a perfect addition to your analysis toolbox. CI Markets Free is our first tier. It's absolutely free. No strings attached, and it does not require any credit card information. Next, we have offerings at $7.95, $14.95, and $24.95 per month. Each of these offerings includes different forecast assets for stocks, ETFs, commodities, and currencies. Go to completeintel.com to find out more and subscribe. Hope you'll join us soon. Joseph, um, we've seen a whipsaw in opinion about the Fed policy over the past few months. I think we peaked out at seven, six, seven rate cuts for the year or something. Um, and we're bordering on kind of zero, and people are even now saying maybe a rise or maybe one after the election or something like that. So um, it's kind of hard to keep up, but kind of not because there's so much, so many Fed speakers out there that it just changes daily, right? So um, earlier this week, you sent uh, out a tweet saying that the market viewed the Fed as too hawkish on policy. Can you walk us through that? Because we've all been on this journey over the last three months as we went from six or seven to one to zero to a rise. Can you walk us through why you think the market is being too hawkish on policy? Sure. First of all, thanks for inviting me. It's great to be here. I watch your show and I always learn something from it. So I'm looking Thank forward you. to hearing what all the other speakers have to say. So Tony, as you correctly note, the market has really been uh, somewhat schizophrenic when it comes to Fed pricing. I think earlier in the year, as you suggested, we were pricing in as many as seven cuts this year. Right now, it looks like, well, maybe one and a half cuts. So there's definitely been a lot of volatility in what the market is pricing. Now, the big shift towards uh, from seven cuts to where we are today seems to be driven by a couple things. Over the past uh, few months, we've had inflation data that has been uh, stronger than expected. It seems like inflation is stickier than the market had expected. Secondly, economic data continues to be very strong. When you're looking at um, employment data, for example, we created, say, 300,000 jobs last month. Retail sales are strong. And so the market is beginning to think that, well, with the economy is doing so well, well, why does the Fed have to cut rates? Now, the second thing that happened is that this past week, Chair Powell, he uh, you know, had his little get-together in Washington with Governor Tiff Macklem of the Bank of Canada, and they were talking about a wide range of topics. Now, Chair Powell made a point to send a hawkish message. He was saying that uh, inflation has been slower, progress on inflation has been slower than he expected. So he basically, there, he's not in a hurry to, to cut rates. And this was echoed by uh, you know the uh, junior people on, on the committee. Now, as you really know, there's a lot of Fed speakers. So when you listen to them, you really got to prioritize. Uh, most of them actually aren't that important. They, they can be ignored. Uh, but Chair Powell, you got to listen to him. President of the New York Fed, John Williams, you got to listen to him. And so the market now, I think, is making the opposite mistake as it did earlier in the year in January. Now, uh, you know, one and a half cuts this year. I, I, my, my personally, I find that to be not, not that's a bit too hawkish. So, the way that I think about this is that the market is misunderstanding the Fed's reaction function when it comes to strong economic data. So. Let's say we rewind a couple of years ago, um, inflation was high, the Fed wanted to basically cause a recession to get inflation under control. From the Fed's thinking was, you know, our tools work on the demand side. So 
if we have inflation, demand pushing against supply, easy. We just raise interest rates, watch the economic growth go lower, watch unemployment rate go higher, basically cause a recession, and then voila, we can have inflation back to target. Now, they did raise rates, but that just didn't play out. The economy continued to be strong. And it seems like there's more and more people at the Fed coming to the conclusion, and Chair Powell included, uh, that the reason why inflation has come down and economic growth has come is strong is not so much that we have an overheated economy that requires uh, ever higher interest rates, is that we had increases in supply. So what's been happening is that it seems because we had millions of people uh, enter the country last year, that's increasing the uh, ability of, of the economy to produce more goods and services, right? So you basically, um, you have more people working, so you can have more growth. And at the same time, uh, you can have uh, more jobs created and you can have wages decline. And so that seems to be doing a lot of the work on the disinflation side. So uh, I think the interpretation of strong economic data with, you know, hawkish Fed, that, that's not right anymore because strong economic data seems to be due to these supply, increases in supply. And you hear people like John Williams emphasize that. Now, the next thing that I would note is that uh, a lot of people have been focusing on CPI being hotter than expected. Let's say it looks like CPI is stuck at let's say three and a half, something like that over the past few months, but that's not the Fed's target. The Fed's target is PCE. Now, PCE and CPI, both measures of consumer inflation, uh, but PC is structurally lower than CPI. There's kind of a wedge between the two. That wedge is actually slightly higher than it is historically now. PCE right now, year over year, about 2.6%. Think about it from the Fed's perspective. My inflation target is 2. My inflation rate is 2.6. Where should rates be? 5.5 uh, seems quite high from their perspective, especially since that they think that they are uh, being the most restrictive they've been in decades. So it would make sense for them to adjust a little bit. So uh, I still think that oh, we still have about three cuts this year. June is probably off the table, but we can start afterwards. Joseph, one of the things I've asked people about from time to time is kind of the normalization of rates because a ZERP environment really isn't sustainable um, because there's, there's no real cost of capital, then there's no real, you know, interest doesn't exist. So are we kind of, is it possible that we are at a kind of a new normal in rates? Is it sustainable to stay at 5% uh, in a rate environment and consider that a new normal? Because what that might what inflation does and what rates do through different levers is they pull some consumption forward, right? Um, and so, um, I mean, you can take a different view on each one and for different reasons or whatever. But um, but having a cost to capital is a normal part of markets. So is there a belief in the Fed that we should actually have a positive interest rate or is is ZERP kind of the target? Does the does the market believe that ZERP is where we should be, and is that kind of the mindset target of the Fed? So just so just looking first at the market. So when you look at short term interest rate futures, the market is coming along to the conclusion that ZERP is a thing of the past. When you look at short term interest rate futures, they're pricing in let's say. Uh, the neutral rates so or the longer term Fed funds rate somewhere around 4% now. Now it is volatile. So they, they do definitely don't think that Fed is going to go back to um to, to 0%. And really, if you look at it, look at it historically, what we saw after the great financial crisis, that was kind of an anomaly over the past you know hundreds of years. You you know, interest rates are not supposed to be at zero. So I would look look at that period as more of an aberration and, and uh, the market does as well. Now, within the Fed, you know, I think that's that's a harder thing to say. There are so many people there. But the way that I would interpret this is to look at the dot plot where Fed officials basically go and they uh, indicate to the market where they think the long run Fed funds rate should be. Now, that uh, has been very, very, very slightly ticking up a little bit. The median now is about 2.5%, which is much lower than the market. Uh, but you can also see that distribution-wise, it's taking up ever so slightly, maybe to 2.6. <laughs> so the, the Fed is always the last to know. Now, so I don't think that they're 
based on the dot plot that they think that we're going back to ZERP either. So I, I almost feel, and this is kind of way out there, so just bear with me, but um, ZERP and NERP almost have on some level been seen as a solution to demographic issues. If you look at Europe and you look at Japan, uh, zero or negative interest rate has been a way to make up for productivity losses as people retire, as people get older, as you know, this sort of thing. And it almost feels to me like that ZERP environment was a way for the U.S. to bridge the gap between boomers and millennials. And if you look at Japan, I feel like this is why Japan is trapped at ZERP or NERP because, and Korea is there soon. If they're not there, China will be there very soon. So it, is it my hypothesis about zero or negative interest rates being a way to a cheat code, I guess, for demographics. Is that real or is that kind of a, a way off kind of view of the world? Well, there are definitely people who think that, uh, you know, aging demographics is disinflationary, argues for very low interest rates. But there's another school of thought as well. Um, so, for example, Charles Goodart uh, of the uh, formerly of the London School of Economics, he would have a very interesting argument where he would say aging demographics actually means that interest rates need to go higher. Now, why is this the case? So as the population ages, uh, people retire and there's less of a supply in labor, right? Now, let's say, imagine you are in the US today, 50% of the people suddenly retire tomorrow. Okay, well, who's going to do all the work? Who's going to clean the streets? Who's going to cook up the meals? Who's going to drive the cruise uh, ships all the boomers are going to go on, right? So in that case, what happens is that the uh, labor, price of labor goes up, and also the amount of goods and services the economy is able to produce also declines, right? Because you have fewer people working. Now, in order to maintain inflation, you'd have to increase your real interest rates to prevent people from spending money today and so that you can distribute the goods and services which are fewer now to 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 the people who, who want them so in that case in order to you know as you wages go higher as prices of everything go higher if you want to target inflation you'd have to keep interest rates higher so that's another vision of the world um you know it's hard to know which vision plays out i think one of the interesting things that we saw during the pandemic was well, you did have this sudden supply shock, negative supply shock of labor, where you had a lot of boomers suddenly retire. I think the estimate is that 2 million more boomers retired than than had been projected pre-pandemic. That really did seem to drive up um, wages and have mm -hmm. some upward pressure on inflation. Uh, but again, the jury is still out. So we can we can uh, definitely we've never kind of never been in this demographic situation before throughout history. Throughout history, right, the population, people have big families, people continue to grow, population grows, that all changed in the 1980s, so we actually have a shrinking population, or at least the workforce population in the U.S. is not growing as well much, in China it's going to be shrinking, in Europe it's going to be shrinking as well, so it's uh, it will, it's definitely something that's <laughs> going to be very, very interesting to see. Adam, what's your thought on that? Demographics um, and interest rates. I think I think Joseph brings up great points on that. And uh, there, it reminds me, there was a good book I read, oh, man, t uh, 10 years ago. It was called The Great Of course Wave. there is. Uh, no, I mean, but it ties to what exactly what he was saying, actually. Um, it's called The Great uh, Wave by David Hackett Fisher, the historian. And he goes back and looks at um, price cycles since uh, 1100 A.D., and he found that there were periods back then it was very like supply constrained. We didn't have the industrial revolution back then. So, you know, a crop failure could send grain prices through the roof. Also times of peace, there'd be more, uh, you know, men weren't dying. They were having more children at a younger time. So more mouths to feed. So you had demand, uh, pull inflation for more mouths to feed, 
supply uh, cost push inflation uh, just from diminished supplies of a crop failure etc and then there was the monetary uh inflation where the cent well, not central banks but the monarchs back then you know when uh, they sent columbus to america and they just took all the silver that entered the system back in europe or you know etc and one thing i found that was interesting that there were three big pivotal points and the first one was the black death the great you know the black plague and it wiped out a massive amount of the world's population and they saw like 50 years of deflation it was like 50 60 years of deflation even and yet uh labor wages were rising for uh you know farm hands and etc because there was just not enough uh supply of labor that the you know landowners had to over over bid them up essentially and it mm -hmm. still didn't create any inflation because even though they were getting paid more in i guess in real terms back then the offset of the actual demand from you know 50 60 percent of the population in some areas being wiped out it it over you know compensated those losses so i would say going forward I'm curious if the demand from the youth will offset what the older spend. And I think Joseph brought up good points, though. I mean, if there's a lot of equity that's been made in household wealth, if the retirees cash out and they want to go on these cruises, that would be, you know, that you would be demand until healthcare costs kick in and usually in the 80s. But the other thing is that I'm worried about is if the if the boomers are retiring for someone to sell, if they want to get out of these positions, liquidate their portfolios, take out income, et cetera, they have to sell to someone. So if someone's selling at a million, that means someone else has to buy at a million. So if a younger person yeah. is buying that at a million, he now has a million less to consume, but now the retiree does. So I guess it would just have to depend where that money would go. And I was actually going to ask Jeff, uh, I'm sorry, Joseph, a question earlier when he was talking about the Fed. I was curious on his take, if you think the uh, with the US, I think debt to GDP came in over 6% last year, 2023. And it was one of the, I think it was the highest one outside of a recession, out of recession or wartime in the last like 60 years I was reading. I was curious if you think that stimulated growth on the US side. Yeah, that, absolutely. So, you know, when the government, so the government is different from from you and I in that when it spends, when it spends, it, 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 can, it can actually just pay for it by issuing debt, right? So if I give you a US treasury security, um, that's basically giving you dollars, right? So uh, when you're engaging in tremendous amounts of deficit spending, as you suggest, Adam, you are basically printing and spending. And if you print and spend, that's going to be stimulative to the economy. And if you are uh, if you are stimulating beyond the capacity of the economy to produce, then you get inflation, which is part of the story of what happened over the couple of years. The U.S. deficit is projected to be at least 5% forever going forward. So that's that's going to be, I think, quite inflationary. That's something that we've actually seen throughout history and we see across the world as well. It's a very reliable sign, a very reliable indicator of uh, inflationary pressures. No, I agree. And and just uh, uh, if you had any more insights, I know you're you know, uh, brilliant on these topics with the monetary plumbing of issuing so much debt i was looking at um you know overnight reverse repo has been bleeding out they ended the btfp uh feds rolling off its balance sheet i'm assuming they'll probably taper that i'd imagine if the treasury keeps uh issuing bonds and the banks have to start would they essentially be diverting their reserves then if these other pools are gone to pull from to absorb that and do you think that would if so, would it create any problems in the banking sector? So banks, so reverse repo is like a pool of liquidity that right now is, you know, being drawn to our fund repo, basically. So what you, what you have right now is you have a lot of you know, institutional investors like hedge funds who are borrowing in repo to buy treasuries as part of a, a basis trade. Now, going forward, we issue a lot of treasuries. I think there is a possibility that, well, okay, a good good chance that the market will have trouble digesting all of this stuff, uh, simply because the market's not as elastic as it used to be because of regulations that were designed to make the banking system safer. Now, the good news is that there's obviously very easy solutions to this. One of them is to just to 
know, toggle the regulations a bit and to encourage banks to buy more treasuries. I, I think you hint at this. Now, um, banks historically in the U.S. don't actually own a lot of treasuries. They do much better owning other stuff, be it loans or be it mortgages. Um, but banks are different from most other investors in that they're highly regulated. And so you, when they, whenever they make an investment, they, they have to take that into account. You can definitely tweak the regs and there's some discussion of this to make it more attractive to them to buy treasuries. And if that's the case, you know, you have another source of uh, demand, but at the end of the day, if the treasury market becomes disorderly, you can always have the Fed buy it. And that's certainly what we saw in the UK when we had some volatility in the gilt market uh, last year or maybe two years ago, I forget. So anyway, the, the Bank of England just came and they, they stabilized it. So this is something that can be solved, but it is definitely a source of volatility. And um, I, I do think that there is a good chance we would have some more, I think, Oh, great. Surprises Thank you. there. Yeah. We've also seen that in Japan too, right? With the BOJ buying finance ministry debt as well. I mean, that's just, it just has become a feature with um, a lot of this activity with mature countries, mature economies. Yeah. Maybe one day the Fed love it or hate it form of yield curve control like Japan. It wouldn't be the first time in World War II. Fed had yield curve control as well, right? So these are tools that the central banks know how to use. And if worse comes to worse, they could always roll them out. Yeah. By the way, Joseph, I said, I've said this before, but, you know, um, I, I actually think it's very easy for people to criticize the Fed. Um, I actually think given the challenge they've had over the past four or five years, They've actually done a very good job, I think, of managing things. I don't love the inflationary environment, but given all of the things that they've had coming at them, I actually think they've done a, a, a pretty good job at it. And it's really hard to suggest a path that they could have done differently to navigate both the kind of the markets, the economy, and the politics uh, associated with the environment that they've had. talk a little bit about QT. Um, you, you've kind of gone gone there a little bit, but you posted a comment on QT earlier this week uh, looking at, um, uh, you say, the, the Fed securities today are about $7 trillion after imminent taper. QT looks to be about $45 billion a month. So, and you say that will run for about one to two years, and then Q will likely move into some sort of QE. So can you talk us through that? Why, you know, why would that run for two years and then and then reverse? And is it possible that that could accelerate because that drains money out of the market, right? Which could potentially be a uh, disinflationary uh, catalyst. So the Fed has been doing QT for for some for you know almost two years, so. They've been doing it at a maximum rate of about $95 billion a month. Now, it looks like they are strongly suggesting that next month they will begin to taper it and it will go probably at a maximum. Well, so they're probably going to half their treasury run runoff from 60 to 30 billion a month. So that's probably going to lead to about a runoff of about 45 billion a month. Now, they're telling you they want to slow down the pace of runoff because they think that as the reverse repo facility bounces become low, they want to be a bit more cautious. One of the things that, so in September of 2019, we saw repo rates kind of spike a bit. And their interpretation of that episode was that they were too aggressive with QT and they want to avoid a repeat of that episode. So second time around, they're saying that, hey, we've done a lot of QT so so, so far. And now that we think that we're getting closer and closer to, to maybe where we might stop, let's slow down and be a bit more cautious. Now, as they slow down next month, most likely next month, that doesn't necessarily 
tell you anything about when they're ultimately going to end. So uh, that's that's going that's an open question. Now, this past week, the Open Markets Desk of the New York Fed put out their annual report, and in that annual report, they have projections as to where you know potentially the Fed could end. Now, to be clear, the Open Markets Desk, in making this report, doesn't have any special insight of the future, and it's not some kind of document that that's intended to communicate the Fed's plan. It's just their best guess. So their best guess is in this scenario, let's say we could do QT for another one to two years. So they could say that, yeah, maybe we can do QT. Uh, maybe we'll stop sometime in, in late 2025. Um, so I think all things equal, this is positive for the market, right? So again, slowing down QT, private sector has less treasuries it needs to digest. Again, the drain of liquidity slows down a little bit from the banking sector. Um, but it's really hard to know when the ultimate QT will stop. I, I, I imagine what would happen is that we get some kind of economic slowdown. The Fed cuts rates, shifts to easy mode, and naturally stops QT as well. So we have a floor, it looks like, that expected floor is about $6 trillion. We'll just keep that on the balance sheet. Yeah, yeah, that's that's how it works now. So after, after the great finance, so before the GFC, before 2008, the Fed had a pretty small balance sheet. Uh, it had what you call a scarce reserve regime. Afterwards, the whole framework changed. The Fed has a big balance sheet now. Why? It's because they think that, okay, so once upon a time, if you're a bank, right, where do you keep your cash? You would keep your cash actually at another bank. Uh, it's called the federal funds uh, rate. So banks obviously need cash to meet redemptions, withdrawals from clients and so forth. Now, the bank used to keep their cash at another bank, which totally works and worked for, for hundreds of years, except that when you have credit risk in the banking system, then you know, maybe one bank you know, deposited at another bank, that bank fails, then this bank can't meet its redemptions, and then everyone fails, you have this huge daisy chain effect. After the great financial crises, banks all keep their cash at the Fed. Now, because everyone keeps their cash at the Fed, and these, these balances are called reserves, Fed naturally needs to have a bigger balance sheet, because now they are the, um, uh, where everyone, all the banks store their liquidity. Okay, so that $6 trillion isn't just kind of laziness holding MBS or something like that. It's, you know, it's banks actually putting their deposits in the Fed for short-term periods. Is that the right read? Well, they need cash. Well, banks need cash, right? After all, after all when you go and you withdraw cash from the bank or make bank makes big, make payments on behalf of you, they need cash. So yeah, they structurally need a larger balance sheet. It's just a fundamental change in how the banking system operates pre and post yeah. great financial crises. <laughs> Joseph, what, you know, you know the Fed better than anyone I know. What are what are we missing? You know, what are we missing right now that people aren't noticing about what the Fed is or isn't doing? I think the big trend going forward is that the Fed is probably going to be a less influential in shaping market prices going forward. Um, so I think the big structural change in the world is, as I discussed earlier, this fiscal deficit. Now, Fed obviously has a money printer, but Congress does as well. They print treasury securities, which are money-like assets. Now, they're printing a lot, and they expect to be printing a lot going, for going forward. And as they become more prominent, I think the Fed is going to become less prominent in shaping uh, economic conditions and market pricing. Um, How much of that is a legacy? Uh, I remember 10 years ago when Yellen as Fed chair was begging for fiscal. Uh, and, you know, she was saying, look, we, there's no fiscal coming. This is all monetary policy. We have to have some fiscal. Now that she's Treasury Secretary, I mean, she's set some really interesting strategies and, in, you know, in what the Treasury is doing. How much of what you're talking about, about the go forward path, is because of Yellen's absence of fiscal as she was the, the Fed chair. Um, do you think that's a legacy of, of that era? Uh, yeah, Tony, I think I think that's exactly right. So oftentimes, so we, so in the 2008 financial crises, afterwards it led to what we call the Great Recession, where growth was slow, unemployment was high for an extended period of time. And I think the, what we learned from that episode is that, you know, we could have done more fiscal. That would have been very helpful. Now, 2020 comes along. We 
we take that lesson into account, we spend tremendous amounts of money. And, you know, economy, V-shaped recovery and everything is fine. But then again, we're, we're forgetting the lessons that we learned in the 1980s and 70s. And basically what all governments knew uh, for hundreds of years before is that when you spend a lot of money, well, you get inflation. And it's very difficult to stop because it's very politically unpopular. Uh, you need to, when you stop spending all that money, you get a recession and you get voted out of office. So we are on uh, a pathway that is well-trodden and has uh, been seen over and over again throughout history. And it usually doesn't end well, but it, it can be quite good for asset prices. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> Thanks for that, Joseph. It's, uh, Tony, go do you ahead, mind Adam. if I comment? I had, Absolutely, yeah. Uh, I had a... I think also the structure of the uh, the economy, like uh, how GDP is in the U.S., like consumption, investment, net exports, government. Uh, I think that matters too for our fiscal deficit because uh, I think you know Japan's had a what they're two hundred thirty percent debt to GDP, huge fiscal supply, and they've couldn't get inflation going for what almost three decades at that time until it took a supply shock, and I think it was it just showed that the Government, well, the banking system in Japan too. They they had rates at zero, that uh, you know, negative and quantitative easing, but they couldn't force people to borrow. And I think I that was a lot of problem with the Fed too. Is that you you can't if if households don't want to borrow, take out the debt, the money, you know, the credit isn't created. And I think with the Treasury after COVID, it was like, hey, now the government's going to directly put this money in your bank account, or we're going to forgive loans. PPP yep. loans, et cetera. And I think, yeah, that was a huge structural change because it, it literally actually forced it as like a liability free net asset into the private sector. And I think that's the playbook they're probably going to keep doing going forward, uh, just as usually they go back to what kind of worked previously. So I am curious how that's going to play out, but I do think it will it, it will probably have some repercussions on the economy. Yeah, absolutely. I think the the PPP and the direct transfers post COVID. And during COVID, I think it really changed the expectations for a generation. Um, and it's, it's we're going to have that with us for at least the next decade in terms of those expectations. Does that make sense to you, Joseph? Absolutely. I mean, I, I opened the news and Biden's forgiving student loans, Biden's giving money to buy new homes and, and so forth. You're shaping an expectation that people are going to expect more and more free things. Now, that really fundamentally tilts the risk towards more inflation and, and higher asset prices because we know the reaction function is going to be, let's just spend more money. After all, it's not my money. <laughs> we can just print it. Yeah, moral hazard. Yeah, I, I was actually talking with someone about that I, recently. I said, I, you know, with house prices, how they are, the car price, I mean, they're just extending out loans now, lower down payments. You can do all these things, but when you're taking out credit, credit is demand, right? You go to a bank, you're like, hey, I'm going to buy a car. We'll give you a loan. You're purchasing something. That guy goes, takes the money, deposits it. So whatever. So if you get to that capacity where they can't borrow anymore, or the balance sheet is like, Hey, you know, I, my utilization's up and banks, you know, let's say they don't want to lend or they're just getting skittish. Uh, you know, that, that does become a problem because I don't see how anyone would be able to afford an auto, a you know, not anyone, I shouldn't generalize it, but you get the point, like a home, uh, an auto loan, student loan. So then the government comes in and says, hey, we will subsidize it, back the loans, et cetera. I mean, they don't do that in auto, but it kind of puts a floor in because otherwise I would imagine prices would have to collapse to the point that people with wage growth alone could afford it if they didn't take out credit. And I don't think the auto companies, the lobby groups would want that to happen, obviously, you see their margins get crushed or anyone who's holding the bag so I don't I don't know if I said something incorrect there, but that that's kind of how I look at it, and I think is here's the only see, incorrect thing you said, Adam. They don't do it in auto yet. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I think they're, I think we're going to see more and more of the government doing these kind of things just because they got to keep you know prices from collapsing because you're going to piss off one group of people, um, and then you know so forth. Yeah, it's uh, we're in new territory. I think it's. You know, as Joseph said about more fiscal, I think we're we're just going to have to see what happens over the next few years. We're going to have to see what happens with the election in November and what happens going into 25 um, to see in terms of continuity. And just because we have a change of parties doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to change, right? Because the Republicans have 
not been more fiscally responsible than the Democrats. So there's the brand, but then there's the reality of things. And so I, I, I don't know that a change of party, I'm not saying it won't, but I, I'm not convinced that a change of party will necessarily change the trajectory. Um, I agree, so they're both speaking constrained. Of, yeah, absolutely. Speaking of central planning, let's talk about China for a minute. Um, so uh, Adam, you talked a little bit about Chinese exports uh, this week. And um, it's pretty bleak. Uh, since you said that, there's been a chorus of people worried about China overproducing and dumping goods on global markets. Uh, can you tell us what that looks like? Kind of what products or areas would you expect that to happen? How quickly could that happen? What would happen to the CNY? Uh, or what would need to happen to CNY? Um, I, I'm just really curious if you know if China is turning to exports as a as a vehicle of growth, which is which is a, a 40 year old story for China. If they're turning back in that direction, to be honest, to me, it looks like they're stepping backward. But but what does that scenario look like to you? So yeah, you and I, I think almost a year ago, we were talking about the auto sector that was just it was just getting out of control with Chinese exports, and they they overproduce cars. I think 2.5 cars and produce per one consumed in the in their uh, economy now solar panels is a big one they're just dumping solar panels everywhere i mean they i think they them alone outpace global installation global installation uh by what 220 percent just china and it's flooding into the netherlands it's flooding into germany uh and europe now the u.s imports of solar panels have surged you know brussels now is trying to do, do tariffs and uh, you know, et cetera, quotas. They're saying uh, the companies are saying it's not enough. Uh, I think Longyi uh, Green Technology in uh, in China, it's a major player. They just had to lay off a, a good amount of their workforce because you know the margins are getting crushed at this point because there's just too much supply. Um, and China just they got to figure out where to put it. They've been ramping up on manufactured investment. There's a good chart from the Atlantic uh, Council. And they had posted a thing as the property investment in China uh, year over year has plunged. It, it just nosedove. The other side was manufacturing suddenly ramped up to like offset it because otherwise, yeah, they, I mean, if both were down, you would have slower growth domestically in China, especially with their consumer on the relatively weak side. They also China also has an excessively high savings rate, um, and they don't really have any social you know, benefits or systems in their economy to promote consumption. And the, that's kind of been the talk last year. Now we've seen them saying, okay, is China going to do targeted fiscal stimulus? And it looks like they're doing some, and it looks like they're going to hit a bigger, I wouldn't say fiscal deficit, but they're, they're, they're starting to crank it up. But I think they are more keen towards a manufacturing uh, rebound. But the problem is they're too big to export their way out of this problem. Like the scale wise, it's the second largest economy in the world by a wide margin. It's not as if Russia or Japan suddenly were trying to export their way into higher growth or Brazil. I mean, when China does it, it everyone's going to feel it. And I also think it's important because Chinese exports is now uh, pissing off Brazil. Brazil has come out and, and everyone's saying, oh, you know, Juanization or de dollarization with Brazil is joining with China. Uh, just two weeks ago, Brazil foreign trade ministry basically set up uh tariffs they're they're looking at the probing of major sectors because china's just dumping goods into their economy and they they uh, they don't want them because it crowds out their own manufacturing capacity uh now you you know it's probably going to restart trade wars uh in the u.s obviously the biden's now talking about steel there's pictures of tons of steel that they're not using in china because they bought all of it where does it go they're trying to dump it on the global markets now you know, Joe Biden's even talking about, you know, steel tariffs, solar panels and the EVs flooding into Germany and Europe. Well, Germany's a big auto producer, right? I don't think they would be very happy about getting their manufacturing crowded out to subsidize Chinese growth. And I think that's the problem with China now is that they're trying to eke out their own growth, and you know, which they have a lot of structural problems in their economy, but they need to keep the growth rate generally going somewhere relative to their debt that they're trying to dump it and put them on the rest of the world and the rest of the world now is starting to you know tariffs quotas etc and i think it's interesting because uh in the uh after the great depression had started or right at the beginning they 
kind of went down this trade war route. A lot of countries started, you know, putting tariffs on each other because the idea was back then, hey, we don't want your goods coming in. Very protectionist. We don't want your goods coming in. We want to produce and sell. And then that next country would be like, all right, well, we're not going to do that. You put a tariff on us. We're putting one on you. And then I think it was the Smoot-Hawley Act, actually. And then they just, everything, it just kicked off everybody putting trade tariffs and barriers on each other. And it just, you know, it became a, a big problem for global growth every in every economy because whatever they couldn't consume at home, they were trying to dump abroad and they couldn't get it out. So unemployment had to go up. And yeah, I think that's, I, remember, I, I think that's the problem. I remember in 2017, when a guy started putting tariffs on Chinese steel and other goods and people said, uh, adding tariffs and anti-dumping is not the way to do things. We just don't do that anymore. And now we have Brazil, Europe, the Biden administration and other guys all saying that tariffs are the answer and anti-dumping is the answer. So, you know, it's strange that kind of seven, eight years ago, people said we need to accept this because it, it puts the American consumer in a better position. If China overproduces, it puts us in a better position because we can afford more. But yeah, now, yeah, now we're hearing all these countries that criticized a guy seven, eight years ago and uh, a president who was very much on the other side of the guy seven, eight years ago now doing the same thing. Right. And yeah. so are we do does China overproducing not put the U.S. consumer in a better position? Does it or does so, it not? I mean, we, we need to it, we need to look at these arguments consistently. It's a it's a good point there there's a pro and a con to it like everything there's it's always a double edged sword um yes manufactured goods uh for instance solar panels per kilowatt i think it's down like 90% in the last few years so anyone getting solar panels great as a consumer it's like this is awesome i can get solar panels much cheaper etc so that that's always good having the supply but it I think with what China's doing is that they're operating at huge losses. That's the problem with China. They're just trying to get the growth going. And by them subsidizing, the Chinese government subsidizes the hell out of their manufacturing sector yeah. is that it, it it's flooding out as that overcapacity to prevent unemployment at home. Because otherwise those, right. account, those businesses would have to have, they would lay everybody off, they go bankrupt, et cetera. Whoever right. lent to them's on the hook and so forth. Yeah. So as it comes into these economies, Yes, we can have the deflation from it, but then at the same time, how long will it take until that deflation here prices out? Uh, you know, like we saw Tesla. Now that let's just use them, they couldn't. Their sales drop. China's now overproducing EVs, so they're not consuming as much Tesla vehicles because they're producing so much at home that they're even trying to get right. theirs out, which is crowding up Tesla's margins in other or markets. And then right. Tesla has laying off employees, even though that in Buffalo this week. So that's the problem. And then once you have the people start getting unemployed here, I think that will overwhelm the political picture. Then prices being down yeah. in manufactured goods when you have, you know, a million get laid off. But again, the, the argument seven, eight years ago was Chinese subsidies eventually help U.S. consumers. And we're hearing the same people today say just the opposite. And so I, I just, for, for consistency of reasoning, I'm not accusing you of doing this, Adam, but I'm just saying that in the political environment, we have to have consistency of reasoning. Do, oh, yeah. do Chinese subsidies help U.S. consumers or do they not help U.S. consumers? Do we look at this in a kind of GATT trade environment, which I, I say again and again to people, the average tariff globally is 2.4%. That's from the, the World Bank, okay? It's not huge. Tariffs are not huge. They're not a huge drag on the world economy. And so when we put things at, say, 25%, that's raising tariffs by 10 times on, say, steel or something like that, right? And so that is a drag on that. And, you know, I think, again, we just want to be intellectually honest and be consistent with uh, you know, with the reasoning. Now, when we look at Japan, so, so uh, you know, I, I assume that on some level, if China wants to sell these overproduced goods, they're going to have to devalue their currency, which they have been over the last few months, right? We also look at JPY, which has been devalued to what, 154, 155 right now, something like that. And that tells me on some level that Japan is trying to be export competitive. Maybe that's not the prime reason, but, you know, they're trying to be somewhat export competitive with their goods on a devalued JPY. Um, so if we have China and Japan doing it, Korea is going to have to do it too, right? So, and Northeast Asia produces, what, 40% of all manufactured goods globally or something. So if we have currency deval in Northeast Asia, that creates a huge consumption opportunity for the West and really helps to bring down 
inflation. Is that, am I being kind of unreasonable no, in my no, assessment? No, no, that, no, that's, that's true. And, and and like we were saying earlier, uh, after the Great Depression, it started with the currency war, similar, everyone trying to underpeg each other. And then it went to tariffs and trade war because, you know, it just spiraled out of control. And I do think how I would put it is for the consistency, because I agree with you and, and politicians, you know, I wouldn't, you know, put too much faith in what they say, just pandering. But I think if you look at you like U.S. manufacturing sector prior to this year or last couple of years had been dying since the 1980s. And so if you were in manufacturing, obviously those imports from abroad weren't great for you. But if you were someone who wasn't in manufacturing, you're in the service sector, then it was good for you. And I think that's where it's always going to be a double edged sword. And I guess whatever lobby group, uh, you know, auto is a big one in the U.S. So I think if if China wants to keep flooding EVs all over, I think that's going to really uh, take it to the next level. But I think you're right with Japan. Uh, Japan's like I think it was their uh, GDP one one GDP report ago. It, it basically all their growth came from exports. It, it was it was essentially like ninety percent of it was from the exports, and uh, they were saying that cheaper yen. And I think it's mainly because the spread difference between the U.S. rates in like um, Japan is is hurting it, but with China, China's cutting interest rates while the U.S. is raising them, and it's put pressure on the uh, yuan, yuan and and I do, but it it has helped their exports. It's made it more competitive. But on the flip side. It's also made their imports more costly. And with Japan, right. it's not as big of a deal because Japan's a smaller economy. Like we were saying, if they want to try to grow their way out, that's not going to unbalance the global system. I mean, it's not the 1980s where Japan was, you know, really coming in hot right up on the, uh, you, know, behind, you know, West Germany and Japan behind the U.S. But now it's China's just way too big. If they reduce their imports relative to exports, which is what we've seen, their imports have been terrible that's a huge drag on global growth, right? Because all these economies, I mean, that was the whole thesis we heard about China. It's like, oh, they're going to have the middle class that's going to consume and, you know. They've been saying it for things. 30 years. Yeah, and that's the problem. That Their current account surplus is bigger now uh, than right. before, 10 years ago. And I think that's the problem is that they are just not net consuming and now they're actually net producing and it's yep. going to force the rest of the world to absorb it. Tracy, can you come in here, you know, Adam's talking about, say, um, uh, EV, EV uh, say, solar cells and that sort of thing. And we've talked before about um, the difficulties that operating companies are having with, say, windmills and solar and that sort of thing. And if those parts are cheaper, the operation is still relatively expensive, right? So will the say necessarily the cheaper solar cells or wind parts will that make a a big dent on the ability of these operating companies to operate these solar farms and and uh and wind farms not if you're talking these large scale projects obviously that's going to make it much easier for say the residential customer that wants to put yep. solar panels on the roof and of course that's going to be you know, that's going to be great for them. But if we're talking about these large scale commercial projects, we're still in a non nerf environment. And so those projects still require a lot of financing, no matter how cheap the parts are. There's a lot more involved than just the parts. And so, you know, again, this goes back to, and we've discussed this before, Tony, where, you know, I said, literally, these these projects are becoming more difficult since we are not in a NERPSERV environment again. Yeah. And in terms of EVs, so, so it sounds to me like what Adam is saying is China is really looking at, say, uh, uh, green equipment and EVs to, you know, support their export export driven economy. But we've seen a drop off in EV adoption of late. Is that right? Or am I misreading that? Well, particularly in the United States. Yeah, we are seeing that. But we have to remember that we're not, we don't import Chinese EVs, right? Their major export market is um, is Europe, is the, is, is the biggest market uh, in the West. And so, um, you know, and we have seen somewhat of a drop off there as well, you know, not as big as the United States, but, you know, we're a very big country. And so the logistics don't work the same here 
uh, plus we don't have the infrastructure build out. But yeah, absolutely. You know, if you look at the top 20 EV companies, 16 of them are Chinese globally. So, um, you know, they have saturated that market. That is their market. They are counting on that. You know, of course, they're going to try to sell those in Africa, South America, yep. Europe, and uh, uh, where grids are very not great, right? Right. So, so it's gonna it's gonna be a problem. I mean, Europe's their best market right now, just because of the fact that they have more infrastructure built out. And you're talking about uh, much smaller countries, generally speaking. Yep. So, Adam, you all, we, the other side of this that you talk about is the uh, consumption uh, in markets. And you posted something about Japan, say the average monthly consumption expenditure per household was up 2.8% in nominal terms, but down a half percent in real terms. So, you know, as these countries are are devaluing or depreciating their currency, Domestic consumption, it, it's it's a lot harder for those consumers to meet their needs, right? Yeah, and there's actually a good, um, so a lot of, the, the predominant uh, school of thought is that when you want to boost exports, you cut your interest rate. I'm sorry, you, you, you uh, cut your currency, devalue it. But there's some good literature that actually says, it's, it's not really about the exports. It's the imports relative to the exports. Because if you export the same amount, but your imports drop, you are you bring in more money. You, still, you will run a, a current account surplus. And they're saying that's the main thing, is that when instead of cutting the currency to boost exports, you're doing it to curb imports, which will increase your uh, the state coffers, essentially, or the, the, the margins for the, you know, whoever the, on the government side and that's the that's the problem with japan right now is that japan doesn't have a strong consumer they they i mean they haven't had one really ever that was you know 1991 they were they were all in it they were kind of what china is today they were a booming export economy i think 15 percent of global exports as a percentage gdp were coming from japan alone before the plaza accord in 86 and then it dropped down to eight percent by 91 but also you you know, the U.S. essentially forced Japan and West Germany to let their currencies appreciate. So their demand side started increasing. Debt started increasing their economies, mainly because the BOJ, to offset that, uh, the loss of export productivity or exports, they cranked interest rates down very low to try to keep growth going at home and not being mm -hmm. stuck in a, a deflationary trap from such a rapidly appreciating currency. And you saw household debt balloon. You saw real, obviously the real estate market was hot and the banks, everything blew up. And I think that's what China is now trying. They're, they're talking, you know, about doing is now they're just doubling down on what got them here in the past. You can only build so many ghost cities and those take a ton of commodities. And, mm. you, you know, I mean, think how this is going to affect Australia, Brazil, et cetera. Like there's so many iron, uh, iron ore, copper, et cetera. That's going into China and smelting, and it was just it's not going to be used. And, and well, these guys have been struggling with. I've worked with a lot of mining firms over the years, like not as customers, not I didn't work for them, but they've struggled for the last say ten or fifteen years. Their big question is where is the next China? Right, they're trying yeah. to figure out where is the next China. There isn't it, another China. This is a gener that was a generational opportunity. It's not coming again. The only one of scale, it would have to be India. In India, it, it runs a current account deficit. Different. It's a big one. Yeah it's different, a, very different no it is very it's hard. very different i completely agree with you it's it's totally different i, I just mean potentially scale wise it's the only yeah. one i would imagine that could replicate china but then you have the same problem if india goes the same route as uh, china and japan and brazil and scandinavia did back in the day to boost exports if they go all in on infrastructure and manufacturing then you're just gonna have everyone focusing on manufacturing and and where's right. the demand from and michael pettis does a lot of good work on this he shows that like global issues today is under consumption. The U.S. is essentially carrying the entire economy because we're the net consumer. We consume over a trillion yeah. dollars worth of excess. If we weren't consuming this much or we balanced our budget, that's a trillion dollars from abroad that goes nowhere. And then yeah. you have layoff, unemployment in those economies. And that's yep. kind of the problem. Modi has been trying to get Make in India going for a decade now. And it I mean, it's got some traction, but not a huge amount of traction. Hey, Joseph, I want to understand a little bit about uh, the yen and with the struggles that the BOJ has had um, to keep the yen from falling through, you know, whatever, 155, 160. 
there are swap lines in place between the Fed and BOJ. Is that right? And so how could they potentially use those to keep the yen from, from falling further? So the yen has been depreciating significantly. And, and uh, as uh, Adam noted, a lot of it seems to be due to the interest rate differentials. So here in the US, short-term interest rates about five and a half. At Japan, they raised their interest rates the first time in decades from negative 0 0.1 to zero. <laughs> so it's not a, it's not a, you know, a, still zero to five and a half percent. That's a big gap. So it seems like there's a lot of investors in Japan. You know, why don't we just go buy assets abroad? So if you buy fixed income in the US, you get a higher interest rate, or you can even buy equities. You can make a double play, right? Equities go up and you also make money on the currency. So in order to stop this uh, depreciation, there's I think there's usually three things that policymakers do. First, of course, is to do a lot of jawboning. And we've seen that over and over again. A lot. Think, yeah. And it looks like it's not working. So you right it now, doesn't have the credibility that, you know, that they've had in the past for some well, reason. I, I got to put I up or shut up. Right. <laughs> right. Exactly. Yep. Yep. Um, so they did intervene. OK, so the next step, of course, is to intervene. So what you would do is you you would basically, you know, take your foreign currency, take dollars, sell dollars and buy yen. Um, they did that, uh, I, I believe, um, uh, two years ago, fourth quarter of two years ago. So that that actually did have an impact that sent a strong signal and we saw the yen, yen strengthen. But again, it just re-weakened because the interest rate differentials are so large. Now, they have a lot of money. They have about a trillion dollars worth of foreign reserves. Not all of that is in U.S. dollars. But still, Japan, as we all know, is a big exporting nation. They've accumulated a lot of foreign currency. They can definitely, definitely uh, support their currency. But the thing is, you know, it's just a waste because you only buy time. Mm -hmm. The third thing they can do is the big guns. And that's actually to raise interest rates there significantly such that the interest rate differential between the U.S. and, you know, Eurozone, everyone else and Japan is narrower. But that has big impacts on their own economy as well. So they're not going to do that. So they, they do seem to be in a in a pretty hard place right now. Um so one thing I will note, though, since you guys were talking about the possibility of tariffs and so forth, you know, uh, there's an article from Politico uh, citing that, you know, Trump trade advisors are, are talking about a dollar devaluation. So they're kind of reopening the playbook of uh, once upon a time, right? So tariffs plus dollar devaluation boost U.S. export industry, create jobs and so forth. So, you know, maybe that could happen in a Trump administration. Maybe that will save the, the yen. Uh, there's a lot of when, when you're Careful going what into, you wish for <laughs> when, when you're going into, <laughs> when you're going into this space it's a lot of politics involved it's really difficult to predict and honestly we're, we're going to i think if we hope our policymakers are reasonable and have logically consistency uh, uh we're going to be disappointed <laughs> yeah i think it was lighthizer who was talking about that and he's a lawyer i mean i understand the you know potential theory underneath it but i think these type of policies tend to overshoot. So we just have to be really careful if that's the path we're going down. Adam, what do you think about that dollar D value? You think it's potential it's, possibility? It's, I think if as a reserve currency, you know, what is it? Uh, Triffin's dilemma, right? You have to have a perpetual deficit because any con country, you are the reserve currency. Everyone, how are they going to get the dollars they need to import from around the world unless you're running a deficit net dollars? which is, there's clearly huge demand for, um, I, for the U.S. to devalue, it had to be, it would devalue its relative, right? I don't yeah. think China, who's also a huge exporter, or Japan would sit idly, or Europe too, actually, they run a huge current account surplus since the uh, pig implosion, pigs implosion. I don't mm -hmm. think they would uh, sit idly by and let the U.S. devalue against their currencies right to steal their market share and then they would probably go back and then i think that would make consumption just a huge problem uh, under consumption in the world especially when demographics are starting to look kind of shaky you know the last thing you want is volatility for a retiree anyone over 65 sure um, right because that could definitely impact their spending patterns or their yep. investment patterns so that would you know and then ripple to pension funds and etc yeah and your usd is sitting in about 106 right now i mean that's probably a little overvalued USD, I think that's probably a little over where we want to be. But um, I, seeing a major devaluation just seems 
I don't know, a little bit naive uh, and unnecessary. So yeah, you, um, you would have to see another currency really step up. I mean, the euro was there after 08, right? Like it was the, the dollar D Dixie dropped one well in the 60s. The euro was extremely yeah. high in Canadian dollar. But then, of course, then that imploded, helped implode their economies. And I now I just don't see another economy that has the growth potential, especially with China now flatlining, that would yep. essentially make a big counter to the dollar. It's really hard. Well, there's always the BRICS currency, right? So, yeah, um, yeah. So, so, okay, good. Um, let's move on to energy. Tracy, you, um, you put up a tweet earlier this week talking about hedge funds dumping energy stocks and buying crude oil futures. Um, it's Option. interesting. <laughs> sorry, options. I'm sorry. It's even Can worse. <laughs> right, right, right. Crude oil options. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, tell us about that. What? Why are they doing that? It seems obviously speculative, uh, and especially speculative. where oil. Yeah, <laughs> tell us about that. That's a, that's an understatement. First of all, it's trade up gambling. I mean, and somebody said, <laughs> "Well, you know, I, they're like, well, you know, it's just like investing in physical gold." And I was like, "Well, no, wait a minute. This is first of all, it's paper barrels." And then it's mm -hmm. options on paper barrels. So you're talking a derivative of a derivative. This isn't even right. close to owning anything in the physical market, right? These right. are financially settled products. Um, and you know, if you want, if if you want to invest in physical oil, then you invest in an EMP company. <laughs> That's what you do. And so I, you know, for me, this sounds like I don't know. Maybe they're closing out. Uh, this sounds like gambling to me. I, I just don't have any other. And I kind of made a crazy face on it because I was like, what do you, why would you dub uh, an investment that is doing well? And generating cash. To, 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 to literally throw it on, you know, red number nine. I don't, I mean, right. Um, and since this information came out, you know, we're down six bucks <laughs> and these guys were, you know, the, these option strikes that they were, um, betting on are, you know, pretty high strikes. Now, you know, granted, we don't know if we're, they're just selling, say they're selling a hundred dollar call, or they're actually buying a hundred dollar call. Either way, it's gambling. Right. So is it demand or geopolitical risk or what went into you think went into their calculation to sell operating companies and move into commodity options well i, I that is a very good question and i wish i could talk to some people <laughs> and ask them why because uh you know the people that i talk to that run energy only hedge funds <laughs> are also scratching their heads. Why would you do that? And these are hedge, he, the, the hedge funds that are doing this are, you know, uh, hedge funds that are broad-based hedge funds. You know, they're not solely, because all, uh, all of the people that, you know, because I immediately got on the phone with everybody I know that actually ran uh, at oil only, oil and gas only hedge fund. And they were like, what? <laughs> so, right. Um, you know, so first, I, I'm going to plug Tracy. Anybody needs advice on their hedge fund strategy for energy, contact Tracy. She's amazing. She knows everything there is to know. So that's the first plug. But second of all, like, you know, I that, that just seems to me like there is a huge expectation of risk. They're, they're just accepting so much risk by doing that. Um, and it seems to me like they're ex expecting a huge escalation of tensions in the Middle East or something. Uh, well, obviously, I mean, obviously, they're thinking geopolitical risk, but, you know, I think that, you know, to do that, suddenly, it's just not, um, I, I just really can't wrap my head around the reasoning for that, to be honest with you. I think it's haphazard, and I think it's, uh, you know, you're kind of doing a disservice to your clients, in my opinion. Right. So today's Friday. So we just had this Israel Iran, you know, tit for tat last night and last weekend and other things. And crude's up 1% today. Right. So it almost feels like, and you've said this before, Tracy, we're kind of in a range for a period. Um, so I, I don't know over what period we break out of that. 
but it just feels like there's a we're necessarily and purposely in a range. So I'm trying to understand why people would put you know hundred dollar uh, uh, calls out there. I, you know, I think that we're keep we keep ratcheting higher, right? I mean, we've spent months, we spent months at you know the lower seventies, then we spent months at you know the mid seventies, then we spent uh, you know a few weeks at the mid eighties. Now we're kind of consolidating in that mid eighty zone, and I'm talking about rent here, mm -hmm. um, a little bit lower for uh, WTI, um, but um, you know, obviously you're if you're rolling the dice on this, and again, I don't know how far out they have their options. Are they 2025? Are they 2026? You know, because when you look at the CFTC, COT, they take the total across every expiration. They don't break it down to every expiration. So I don't know, Are you know, are they looking at this this year, next year, 2026, 2027? You know, we, we don't really know. Um, so, you know, that's where some of the uh, information we get is a little bit opaque. Um, but that said, you know, that's a that's a big bet, mm -hmm. right? So they're counting on something and it might not just be near term political, geopolitical issues. It could be, you know, that decision could be a uh, result of a lot of things, depending on how far out you are um, in your strike price. I know this sounds a little bit elementary, Tracy, and I'm, I'm sorry, but I think uh, I just want to understand the risk associated with investing in, say, e &P companies versus risking directly in crude options. You know how how much more risk are you accepting by investing in options? Is it well, three times, ten times? I mean, I know there's no perfect number, but it's it a, a magnitude or you know how does that work? Yeah, it's at, especially when you have oil prices as volatile as they have been, then that's a huge risk because. When are you gonna? What's your stop? When do you get out? What? How much? How much volatility do you want to accept in your risk portfolio? Right. One day you could be down a million dollars. The next day you could be mm. up a million dollars. You know, you have no idea. So it's a big. It's a huge risk to be taking in a portfolio where you're supposed to be an investment. Right. Again. So. Mm. It would seem that if I think oil prices are going higher, I'm going to invest in EMP companies. That way I actually own physical barrels because those companies own physical barrels and yep. I have a piece of that rather than, again, trying to gamble on uh, some sort of option strategy. And, you know, you know, there are funds that we know that have blown up over and over again that have a lot strategy before and so yep. I, again i just really can't wrap my head around it but because i think I, I i just don't really i i just don't understand i wish i wish i could get inside these people's heads and say you know this is what i'm going to do with my investors money i'm going to you know <laughs> gamble it on brent crude yeah. options adam by definition you know say a hedge fund is there partly to hedge risk so you know, what do you think about this? I, I I think it's a God knows what they're all doing. You know, weapons of mass destruction or financial destruction. You know, I think it's a quick way to to really blow up. You know, I think you've seen it, especially when you're playing with options, selling options, naked options. And I, I don't really, uh, I don't know. I don't know what they're really thinking. I think geopolitically, Iran's... <laughs> definitely a big player in oil or becoming a bigger oil. But they're, they're ramping up production because they're not under the OPEC quotas. But, you know, I think the U.S.'s growth has outpaced it. I don't know where a huge amount of gasoline demand suddenly going to come from. It looks like it's kind of already tapered off in China. So I but I do think the mid 80 range is kind of what they're going to want to keep it at. And I know there's been some issues with uh, Ukraine targeting Russian refineries. I think that that was a that was a thing recently. And uh, I, I do think that Iran and Israel are gearing up. That whole region is just a powder keg. And, you know, God yeah. knows how it's going to happen going forward. 
Well, and diesel and jet fuel are definitely very tight. Um, yeah. But I, I, you know, I this straight crude seems uh, a little bit interesting. So let's move on to the uh, kind of final topic: the UAE not cloud seeding floods that happened. <laughs> we keep hearing that it's definitely not cloud seeding. Not cloud There's seeding. no way it could be cloud seeding. It's just definitely not cloud seeding. Um, but Tracy, you talked about the um, uh, crude in Kazakhstan uh, and some potential impact that uh, production setbacks that could happen in Kazakhstan and maybe throughout the region because of that activity. Can you can you talk us through, like, is this a major disruption or is this something that's fairly temporary? It's two separate issues, right? So UAE, um, you know, uh, you know, this did not affect any sort of oil production whatsoever, which is... Oh, by the way, it definitely wasn't cloud seeding. Very out, <laughs> which is very outside of the cities, which is where we saw the major rainfall, right? And so um, yeah. there is no production disruption as, as far as uh, their production is concerned. Now, when we go to Kazakhstan, you know, they had that... The problem with that is they had a dam that broke in Russia... Uh -huh that crossed over the, the water crossed over the border. This, cause this is, this is regions uh, like a small oil producing region, literally on the, the Kazakhstan Russian border. So you had, they had a snow melt, a quick snow melt, which kind of started the flooding. And then hit, we had a dam that broke in Russia that flooded into Kazakhstan. And so that was kind of the, the, problem in that region. So they're kind of two totally different kind of Okay. Uh, but it, in terms of disruption from either the UAE stuff or Kazakhstan, do you see that as a major disruption for crude production or is it kind of at the edges? Mm, at the edges. I, you, okay. know, I, you know, I don't think it's a big deal. I mean, it's a big deal for Kazakhstan. You know, that's certainly mm -hmm. going to, you know, hurt their oil production and the monies they bring in from that oil production. And we'll have to see how long that is offline and you know what it's going to take you know if there's any damage and how long that's going to take etc so um it's more of a kazakhstan's not really a huge producer so it more affects their country and their income more than mm -hmm. i would say global production in total right guys thank you so much this has been we've been around the world and back today i am so grateful for the contributions you've made and thoughts you've had. So I really appreciate this. Have a great weekend and have a great week ahead. Thank you guys. Thanks. Thanks, Tony.